This is NBC. NBC Magazine with David Brinkley. Special edition. A day with President Reagan. One day this week, NBC Magazine spent 16 hours in the White House watching President Reagan and his administration concocting bitter pills, budget cuts, and trying to persuade people to swallow them without gagging. It began with everybody at meetings, eating grapefruit. We'd like to continue having uh, that support for this program that we're going to try to go forward with. I mean, I understand that time frame is extraordinarily tight. With that, I think I'll have to get up and do what the little nine-year-old girl wrote me in a letter, which she said, now get to the Oval Office and get to work. <laughs> And then meetings with labor leaders, the cabinet, governors, and a selling job. Up there ahead is daylight. And in the process, we see Reagan displaying a personal style unlike his predecessors, easy and casual. Well, thank you very much. Hi. Yes, good to see you. Hi, Art. How are you? Just fine. One of the stories we're leaving here about families, the little boy, and I asked him how many brothers and sisters he had, and he said 11. He said, my dad must be very expensive. And the boy says, no, we don't buy them, we raise them. <laughs> and like every president, feeling restricted, closed in. I was reading in one of the magazines, Nancy had some magazines up there the other day. They evidently had uh, a part of a diary of, of Harry Truman. And my, it was, a, it was a better time. He talked about how he delighted in slipping out of the White House and went over to church, walked through the park, None of his advance unit found out about it, slipped into a back pew, said he was hardly, didn't think anyone even recognized him and all, and took great delight in that. It, it well, sounded like fun. There are those who say he can't do it, that the political pressures against cutting federal payrolls, contracts, subsidies, grants, benefits, are so great that Washington, and particularly Congress, cannot stand up to them. Well, that may be true. Modern history suggests it is true. Since 1933 and Franklin Roosevelt and the Depression, nobody has changed the main thrust of the U.S. government. More taxes and more spending, and almost nobody has tried. Reagan will try. In this hour, showing you everything they would allow us to show you, we will be inside the White House as Reagan prepares for his and Washington's trial. Skip breakfast other than what's right here this morning. Thank you. I'm going to stick with just the bacon. Brian Flex. Not all brain, but Brian Flex if you got him in a banana. Yeah. Down the hall from the Oval Office, on the table are grapefruit, oh, coffee, out. and uh, coconut donuts for a 7.30 meeting of President Reagan's senior staff in the office of James Baker to look ahead at the day's work schedule. I think we ought to just play it by ears. Edwin Meese, he came with Reagan from California, now his senior advisor with cabinet rank. Mike Deaver, Baker's deputy, another Californian. Half on Friday and then we break for lunch and come back in with the cabinet for an hour. And Baker, he worked for President Gerald Ford, now he is Reagan's chief of staff. I got one thing uh, that I want to ask about, and that's the Iran uh, agreements. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the president was going to call uh, Secretary Haig today and ask him when those were going to be ready. At 8.10 a.m., the president walks down from the second floor living quarters. His workday starts with a breakfast with union leaders who supported him. In the first floor dining room, one of the prettiest in the White House. This breakfast is more substantial. Grapefruit, poached eggs, sausage, bacon, Danish. Photographers from over in the press room are allowed in for about 30 seconds, what the White House calls a photo opportunity. It is early, and all but the president had to travel across town to get here. The, uh, the breakfast meeting is ongoing now. 
big the uh, national security briefing of the G. A hundred yards away, in the West Wing offices, another staff meeting, Baker presiding, senior members of the staff discussing who, during the day, will do what. Okay, we're all set. You're going to report to the cabinet. Okay. I'm talking to the meeting, The meeting with the uh, governor's race, the executive committee, First, is that Back in the dining room, Frank Fitzsimmons of the Teamsters. There's a lot of unnecessary regulation which would allow greater input and productivity if they were eliminated. Is the president going to discuss that at cabinet? I understand that time frame is yes. extraordinarily tight. They talk of the Reagan speech next Wednesday, joking that the opening and closing are finished, but nothing in between. Ken, Jim, uh, given the schedule, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get a first draft of the speech to him until about Saturday. Now we're meeting this afternoon. Yeah, but uh, I can give you the front end and the back end of that based on that. Then we've got a lot of policy in between. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening and good night. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know that I've run out of time here. I know that you're going to go on having meetings uh, <clears throat> briefings on this program of ours. Let me just say again that I'm uh, most pleased to have you here and gives me an opportunity to thank you all for your support uh, during the campaign. But the catch in it is, uh, as I've indicated already, <laughs> we'd like to continue having uh, that support for this program that we're going to try to go forward with. And in return for that, of course, want your input and uh, continued communication on these problems. Anybody else got anything? So with that, I think I'll have to get up and do what the little nine-year-old girl wrote me in a letter, which she said, now get to the Oval Office and get to work. <laughs> now the breakfasts are over and the grapefruit eaten, and next the president meets one group after another asking help and support in taking control of Washington's spending. It's not too cold. Huh? No. So at 9 a.m., he walks to the office through an outdoor colonnade, a ramp at the end put in for Franklin Roosevelt's wheelchair. Walking with him are Meese and David Fisher, special assistant. Now that little walk was the only fresh air he will see all day. The Western outdoorsman, feeling closed in, insisted on opening a White House window that had been sealed for years. Good morning, good morning. Helene Van Damme is there with papers to sign. He has been known to complain about all the paper, but he can't stop it. In February. Must be 1981. Seems like I've been here long enough now that it should be 1983 or 4, but I don't know. As of today, you will have met then with every level of government, the mayors, the county execs, State, state legislators and now the governors on your economic program. Then uh, after that, Mr. President, Deaver, Meese, uh, and Baker the, uh, run over the day's schedule with him. Governors Association. I think there's 17 or 18 governors. Yeah. Should we go with uh, Dick Allen? Right. Richard Allen, National well, Security see, Advisor, oh, yeah. in for the day's yeah. briefing on world affairs. And Vice President Bush. This is the uh, biography of the new Polish leader. This is the green sheet, which, which updates the, uh, the network news summary that you get in the morning and the overnight wires. And, uh, Jim Brady, press secretary. He will give out whatever news develops today, and there will be some. You plan to do that anyway, hadn't you? Now, is it all right if I go get a drink of water? It isn't on the schedule. <laughs> Across the hall, in the Roosevelt Room, it has paintings of both Theodore and Franklin. Eighteen state governors have come in and are eating jelly beans while they wait. Uh, I'm Murray Wiedenbaum. I'm chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. You can uh, get the American people to understand the necessity of doing what the president wants to do. we got some ideas we want to share with you. We've got yeah, the economy going. Oh, man. They are pretty good, aren't they? When the decisions are made, they're made with what appear to be the most accurate. There's one color for each state in the union. Yes, sir. Well, funny. All, all, all the colors. Yeah. You may not be as good for you as 
peanuts, but you know, they're a lot more fun to eat. While Reagan, in his office, telephones a congressman. Hello? Trent? I just calling again. I wanted to, before any more time went by, thank you very much for what you did in our recent go-round up there. I know that you saved a lot of souls there in the, <laughs> in the back room. <laughs> then Reagan walks over to see the governors. Hi, how are you? He is coming in to do a selling job, and they know it. The photographers are invited in again, another photo opportunity. Some people sniped at me for using the word calamity. Uh, we do face a calamity. But if we can lower the rate of increase in government spending and then stimulate the economy, even though we're asking for tax cuts, you know and I know that tax cuts in the tax rates, which only actually are reducing part of that increase. They're not, they're not, we're not reducing them below what they have been. We're reducing the rate of increase. But if we reduce, if with the stimulant of the economy, that tax line begins to approach now the government spending line, up there ahead is daylight. And then I think there will be further tax reductions we can make. And I would like to take this opportunity on Governor Busby of Georgia of speaks for the governors, the concerned about how, in the new government, power will be divided between anyway, Washington much much and the states. I can start off by saying we all agree with you that the economy is in a mess and immediate steps have to be taken. I think that the roles of the federal, state, and local governments, their responsibilities, their relationships are even a bigger problem. That's one, and there's one I'd like your help on. I have believed for a long time, till I become almost a Johnny One Note on it, that a great many of our problems are because from the federal level there has been a concerted attempt, whether they realized what they were doing or not, to change the basic form of our government, which is that we are a federation of sovereign states. And they've tried to make the states administrative districts of the federal government. And it isn't going to work. And this is why we would like, as the time goes on, we'd like to turn many programs totally back to you for administration and turn back the sources to pay for them. Mr. President, you, you had two very good, splendid, strong lines in your inaugural address saying what you, in essence, just said. And I want you to know that the governors as a body strongly applauded those. But I also want you to know that as we did so, a whole line of congressmen who were standing down on your level, but in front of our box, turned around and said, over our dead body. So now you're going to need our help on the hill, because there's going to be fierce they resistance. Well, maybe over their dead bodies isn't a bad idea. <laughs> we want to help you. <laughs> Second person. Right. Later, Reagan leads the governors back to the same room where he had breakfast with the union leaders. The big table now replaced by smaller round ones. Now, as when he was governor, Reagan likes to use lunchtime for business. Melon and prosciutto, lamb chops, beans, tomatoes, chocolate mousse. And when that's over, the president stands up and answers the governor's questions. Level of people whose job it would be always to answer the question for you. How are we doing on returning power to state and local governments? I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. I wonder if you could give us some sense of uh, your approach to uh, dealing with the peculiar regional problems that affect the Northeast. And I think basically we thought that the first and prime problem has been to restore the economy and uh, to make us productive again. <clears throat> the sooner the embargo can be ended, the better we're all going to be. We're right in the middle now in our cabinet process of this particular problem. After that, the governors, on their way out, stop in the White House press room and tell what they think about their meetings. We are unanimous in our feeling that uh, he's on the right track, that if we're going to get the economy straightened out, uh, the type program that he is setting forth 
is what has to be done, and uh, we're very supportive of it. I think out of courtesy and good sense, I'm not going to begin to argue against cuts that haven't been proposed. While Reagan drops in on a meeting of his new economic advisory board, discussing strategy for getting his economic program approved, some familiar faces are here. Arthur Burns, Herbert Stein, Milton Friedman, I don't know, maybe they will. Cabinet meetings and everything always stop and that's George Schultz, Alan Greenspan. Well, listen, I want to thank all of you for private business and professional people volunteering their help. I know you've been briefed on our on our program and are having briefings more on what it is we're going to propose, and I would I'm they're gonna rush me out of here in a few minutes because I'm I got a meeting with some labor leaders who probably won't be as approving of I don't know, maybe they will be. These union leaders waiting in the Oval Office are those who did not support Reagan. Lane Kirkland, president of the AFL-CIO. Douglas Fraser, president, United Automobile Workers. And they, too, talked to the press outside when they left, but they didn't say much. Well, if, if they're big cuts, will you support them? And it depends where they are and how big they are. That's the basic strategy, all sweetness and light here, but you're going to fight on the hill. It depends on what there is to fight about. Do you uh, really support the idea of uh, President Reagan stripping the government of the 30, 40 years of social programs, New Deal, Great Society? If that's what happens, we'll be fighting. You can talk all you want about cutting spending and balancing the budget and so on. But there is one kind of cut you cannot make, cannot. You cannot take a nickel away from old folks, blind in wheelchairs, school children who can't concentrate because they're hungry. You cannot tax people when they're young and working and then let them starve when they're old. Doing that would destroy any administration and should. Reagan and his people know that. Now, in the White House, it is coming up on time for the cabinet meeting where that will be discussed. Seating for the cabinet meeting, organized. On the table will be coffee and, of course, jelly beans. Reagan has more cabinet meetings than any president in years. He believes in cabinet government. Others generally have not. Regan, Treasury. Smith, Attorney General. Pierce, Housing. Casey, CIA. Weinberger, Defense. Stockman, Budget. Allen, National Security. Haig, State. The agenda is mainly concerned with the economic program, though. Try not to smile too much. <laughs> and um, so with that settled then, I'd like to call on Penn James for a report on our progress in the personnel area. Thank you, Mr. President. The White House is disturbed at complaints. It is slow in filling the big jobs. James puts on a little show for the cabinet and says they're doing better now than most new presidents. Figures that might be of interest to the cabinet because we have received some criticism of the uh, the pace in which the administration is making in the cabinet appointments, uh, sub cabinet appointments. Uh, there have been 42 appointments sent uh, from your officer, and in comparison, and I hate comparisons to previous administrations, but since we're constantly being compared, I looked up Carter uh, track record as of date same date, which is in this case February 7th, where we have sent 42 to the Senate for confirmation. President Carter had sent 18. So uh, that's not too bad. Penn, thank you very much. All right, well, we're getting down to the agenda now, an economic program. 
Uh, I know that <coughs> Secretary Reagan uh, and Dave Stockman have been working night and day to bring together the elements on this program. Then I'm going to, um, uh, before we get into the details of the program, ask Dave Stockman uh, for an interview, for an overview of what's been going on here. I have to say that I am not one to shrink from a tough task. But I must also say, and I think every cabinet member here will agree with me, that the goals that you gave us are extraordinarily difficult to reconcile, but I'm pleased to report today that we're almost there. The four objectives that you gave us as we attempted to formulate this economic plan were one... Stockman at the moment is Washington's big number. So fast with big figures, he scares old Washington hands. He has been through the budget looking for cuts and found a lot of them. Second, to provide the additional resources that we're going to need to rebuild our national defenses and ins ensure our international security. We believe that we have identified, agreed to, or have nearly in hand 49.8 billion or almost 50 billion dollars worth of savings in the fiscal year 82 budget. And that means as we move down the wire here towards the presentation of your plan, we only have about $3.4 billion more defined in terms of achieving the fiscal position and the deficit reduction that we've targeted for 82. What, I, what that means, to recap or summarize, is that we're 93% of the way to the goal that you've established for us. Now, Mr. President, I would like to say that we have been able to achieve that by making some very tough choices. What he I says here turns out to be the day's big the news from the White House, that seven programs that absolutely, positively campaign, will not be cut. First of all, we are proposing no reductions in the cost of living adjustment for the 32 million Americans who receive retirement benefits or disability benefits under Social Security. Secondly, we have proposed to fully fund the breakfast and lunch program for low-income and lower-middle-income uh, children in our schools today who get free lunches and breakfasts. A third program that we have recommended no reductions in is Medicare. Another important program that we've fully protected, that we've recommended no reductions in, is Head Start. A fifth program that I we've avoided... Dave, to say that I think that program is going to save us money in the long haul. Bell, education. That early, we're going to make taxpayers out of potential tax eaters. So That's I precisely that decision. right. I mm -hmm. think it's a wise one. A sixth program that we have not recommended cuts on is the Supplemental Security Income Program. That costs the federal government $8 billion a year, but it provides a decent level of income and a decent standard of living for 4.1 million blind, poor, elderly, and disabled. Finally, a seventh program to give you a further indication that we've recommended no change in is the Summer Youth Employment Program. There is great pressure being put on me, on the White House staff, and on members of the Cabinet to retreat from some of these reductions. But I want to tell you, if we retreat one cent on any of those proposals, then there is no way that I can meet your goals except to recommend some reductions in these programs that we have protected thus far. Dave, thank you very much, and I might say a thank you to all of you. I think this is, is just wonderful. Anything further to, to add? Any comments? Or? I would encourage that, uh, that you give me orders and that everybody stand fast. Want Dave, interior. Because if this starts to waver and we start folding on one or two budget cuts, the whole cutting system will cascade on us and we won't be able to stand tough with the political pressures. Several things I'd like to cut. If, if my back pushed the wall and it should be kept to the wall so that I don't waver on you or that anybody else wavers and causes me to want to cut and run. Well, that afternoon, Jim Brady tells right. the press room about this, about what will not be cut, point, and that's yeah. the lead story in the morning papers and on that night's network news program. The administration made more decisions on what to take out and what to leave in the first Reagan budget. More from Judy Woodruff. White House officials concede they're growing worried that the president's economic package is being perceived as too rough on the poor. That's why Reporters, NBC, to CBS, and ABC, telling the news from out on the White House lawn. As well as showing some compassion. Most of these popular programs got ten billion dollars, more than a quarter of the projected 1982. Judy Woodruff, NBC News, the White House. Look back a little. 
Every president any of us can remember had some kind of style, manner, personality. From Harry Truman, plain and unpretentious, honest and tough, to Jimmy Carter, not all that friendly, the angrier he was, the wider his smile, to Reagan. Hey, whoops. For heaven's sakes. Hi there. There is a style and manner about Reagan, unlike any modern president. Hey, Folksy yes. good-naturedness well, in the way he greets people, yes, tells little jokes, Hi. easy and Just casual. One of the stories we're leaving here about families, the little boy, and this man asked him how many brothers and sisters he had, and he said 11. And he said, my, that must be very expensive. And the little boy says, no, we don't buy them, we raise them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe it's the Western outdoorsy background. He is, after all, the only president in generations who like to ride horses, build ranch fences, cut brush, ride in the mountains, camp out, sleep in a tent, cook over a campfire. Into a victory for you. So I thought you might, that's just personal stories beginning with the New Hampshire primary, some of the things we did for your campaign. Well, thank you very much. I'll enjoy this more than a lot of the things they put on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is because he came to politics late in life did not grow up with the cagey, cautious manner seen in so many lifelong professional politicians. This is your home, properly identified with the family Reagan, the Reagan family, and the logo is families are forever. <laughs> You're wired for sound call, by Yes. I yes, you are. <laughs> Whatever the reason, politics and philosophy totally aside, people he meets find he is not threatening, not overwhelming, not an egomaniac, but a man who, if you're tuned in that way, would be pleasant to be with outdoors, and who could gather up brush, build a little fire, scour out the skillet, and cook a fairly decent hamburger. And you're, and you're still playing very well in Peoria, sir. Remember the sign my husband had up for you? So for the day, the work, the selling, the persuading are over the business of asking people to accept what they don't want to accept. That is, to accept less and to smile, or try to. The workday is over, but for one more stop. Mr. President, you've had about three weeks here in the White House now. How do you like it so far? Well, uh, it's exciting, sometimes frustrating, but uh, it's been so busy that uh, I'm almost caught unawares when you ask a question like that, but I... I have to say I like actually now being able to deal with the things that for so long a time all we've done is talk about. We have been with you all day and you have been in one meeting and then another meeting and then another meeting. Do you like to work that way? Is that effective for you? No, but then I know that there are some days like that. And not every day is like this one where it just went from, from literally one to the other. Uh, when I said it was a little frustrating, on days like that, I see the things pile up on my desk and the folders come in, information, and so and I haven't even time to open them. You were complaining about a pile of paper this high. Uh, yes, and I get a little, I get a little uh, frustrated with that. But I know it has to happen. Tomorrow, on the other hand, will be an entirely different type of schedule, where I'll be able to be at that desk for a few hours at a stretch. Well, given an absolute choice, how do you like to work? Do you like to talk to your group, to your staff, and dis make joint decisions? Or you make the decision, but you discuss them jointly? Oh, I, I like the input, yes, of other people. And our cabinet meetings are that way also, as uh, probably found there today. But that is the only difference between, I've heard them refer to, referred to as a board of directors or something, that's the only difference. I have to make the decision. Have you thought about the fact that the last president who tried really seriously to change the course of the American economy in a substantial way was Franklin Roosevelt in 1933? No one has tried since then? Well, without saying anything uh, about those who followed, there, it is true. And isn't it somewhat comparative today that he came in at a kind of watershed time when the people said, we cannot continue in this path. We have to try something. And he was willing uh, to try. And I think that uh, while it is not uh, as extreme a situation as it was then, 
Maybe the fact that many people alive today went through that same traumatic experience of the Great Depression, that um, they're willing to try because they don't want to see it get to that point. You are making a speech next week giving in some detail what you hope to achieve, right? Have you thought about the reaction you're going to get? Well, yes. <laughs> Are you prepared and for it? I think so, because at, at least here, I had a, a previous experience that relates. Uh, when I became governor of California, uh, we were in, faced with much the same situation. So I know the pressures that can be brought with regard to uh, cuts in the budget and things that have to be trimmed. I, yes, I think I'm prepared, but I think there is one difference now. I think the people today, and I think the members of Congress, are aware that something has to be done. Have you run into the old Washington game? Cutting the budget is fine. I agree it should be done. Expenses have to go down, but don't cut mine. The only thing that licks them on that one is <laughs> that uh, there isn't anyone exempt. Have you thought of saying to those who object, all right, but have you got a better idea? I've thought of it, and I, maybe before the arguments are over on this, uh, uh, I will be saying that. We've gone along for decades now uh, with this belief that uh, we could spend more than we take in, and now the deficit is approaching a, a, a trillion dollars. And I... Uh, it is time to say uh, we should try something different. And uh, if not this, then tell us what. Do you ever have the feeling that you now, in putting this program through, are going to take the heat for something that should have been done a long time ago? Well, uh, I went into this with my eyes open and uh, I'm perfectly willing to do that. It has to be done. At the end of a day like this, all of that persuading and stroking, an outdoorsman allowed a total of 17 seconds outside in the fresh air. He wants to get out. Well, later in the evening, he does, sort of. I was reading in one of the magazines, Nancy had some magazines up there the other day. Uh, they evidently had uh, a part of a diary of, of Harry Truman. And my, it was, a, it was a better time. He talked about how he delighted in slipping out of the White House and went over to church, walked through the park. None of his advance unit found out about it, slipped into a back pew, said he was hardly, didn't think anyone even recognized him and all, and took great delight in that. It, it well, sounded like fun. I'm sure it was, but remember, there was very little television then. Not so many people saw Truman on television. Truman looked like everybody in the world anyway. <laughs> yeah. And he could go anywhere. It's too That's late true. for you. You can't do that. It was too late of for me before was. I got here. Of course it was. Well, as I say, about through. It's been a long day. Yeah. It's not over yet. I got to go to the ballet. Backstage with the Dance Theater of Harlem, run by Arthur Mitchell. Started 11 years ago with next to no money. Now they dance all over the world, are much admired. They were just great, really. That man, Mitchell, who's, who's uh, ahead of it, Took them off the streets and the drug scene and sure. all of that. And uh, they're all, I think that's just wonderful. <laughs> it's a long day, Mr. President. Yes. <laughs> yes, it has been long, but it just starts right in again in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
for all of us at NBC Magazine, including a number who worked all night to get all of this put together fast. Thank you and good night.